are live. We're live right now? We are live. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah. Like for real? Mm -hmm. We're live. Okay. Mm -hmm. Come on in you guys, you can be close. Um, so we are live Facebooking, so you can say hello, hi Facebook. Um, I'm here at the CETA Summit booth, and um, we are going to talk about uh, an adventure that I went on um, to bike up and down Kilimanjaro. Um, so I've got all the gear that I took on Kilimanjaro. We're going to talk about kind of how to pack for an expedition where it's really important the gear that you bring is the right gear, but also that it's lightweight because it's on your back. So this setup here with my bike and the flow backpack, um, that's actually how I set it up for climbing Kilimanjaro. And so obviously I need to have the right gear. There's no bike shops up on Kilimanjaro. Um, you can't go buy an extra pair of gloves if you forgot them. And so I really, the way that I pack for an expedition is I, at home, I think about where I'm going, um, what's the temperature, what are the challenges, how many days, how much food, what do I have access to, and then I lay it all out on my pool table and on the floor um, in organizing by clothing, food, medical kits, and then I start to edit and I start to take things away. And so this stuff that you see here is basically what I took up, um, up and down Kilimanjaro uh, and it was a six day expedition. Um, I took more than three goos, obviously, you know, this is a little bit, but this is pretty much the clothing oh the gear that I took, and so what was really cool about that trip um, is I was carrying everything. The way Kilimanjaro works is they have porters for you, you're actually required to have a porter if you climb Kilimanjaro, but my porter got the easiest job ever because I wanted to carry my stuff, and so he kept saying, Rebecca, we'll take your bike, you know, we'll carry it, I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to carry it unless something really bad happens. So I really wanted to be as self-sufficient as possible. And so um, I'm kind of an anal person. I'm a Virgo. And a lot of the expeditions I do are, there are a lot of uncontrollable factors. Hi. We're live Facebooking, live Facebooking. That's really cool. Um, but I, a lot of the stuff I do is unknown. So for Kilimanjaro, for example, only two other parties had gone to ride a bike up and down Kilimanjaro. So there's not a lot of trail information, there's not a lot of route information. Um, I wasn't really sure what, what, how I should set up my bike. So there's a lot of unknowns in the expeditions that I do. Um, weather can be unpredictable up there. And so I really like to get super, um, super organized with the things that I can control. I call it controlling the controllables, and then that makes me feel more secure when the doo-doo hits the fan and things are uncontrollable. At least I know, okay, I'm gonna be warm, I got a medical kit, you know, um, hopefully, you know, nothing bad's gonna happen if I can control these sorts of things. And so I'll just kind of break it down. I'll start with the sleep system first. I really like to put all my stuff, like even within the backpack, I'll have all my sleep gear in one thing. I'll have my warm clothing in another thing. I'll have my storm wear in another thing. I'll have um, toiletries in another bag. Medical kit, mountain bike tools, food are all kind of separated because um, as you know, you look into the black hole of your bag and you're just like, I just really need something to eat. I'm bonking, I'm losing it. And if you have to go into four or five bags, um, it's a waste of time, it's inefficient, and often you'll just blow it off and say, forget it. I'm not gonna take care of my blister or I'm not gonna eat that snack if you can't find what you need. The other thing I really get, um, you can see I'm very multicolored here. And that's because I hate not knowing, you know, I have a lot of black in my wardrobe. And it's like, what black shirt am I gonna wear today? And so I don't wanna look into my pack and open three black stuff sacks to find which is the one that's my thermal wear. I know, orange is warm. Um, orange uh, orange medical kit, orange and yellow is usually medical. Uh, bike repair is almost always orange. And then clothing, you know, I like to really color code so that I know. The other thing that I do, because I'm often with teammates, is I put orange tape on all my stuff. If you've done any adventure racing or something where like, no, that's mine, no, that's mine, no, that's my clean pair of socks. It's like, no, that is mine. Um, so I kind of mark all my gear as well. So at the end of the trip, when the gear explosion happens, you go home with the stuff that you love. Um, so I, I get a little bit anal that way at home. So we'll start with the sleep system. Um, this is a sleeping bag that I took up on Kilimanjaro, the Spark. And this is the warmest of the Sparks. Very warm. The temperatures were well below freezing up there. Um, and I was a little bit concerned about being cold, but I wanted to take a really light bag. So this is the Mac Daddy for that. I'm not going to open it up. It's really cozy, comfy. Um, but I also did take, so then my sleeping pad as well, obviously. Um, I did take the um, Pumax liner to add a little bit of one, just the kind of nice, comfy layer in the sleeping bag that's sort of like, you know, your movie or, you know, your little blankie. It just feels really good. To me, 
rest and recovery is one of the most important parts of a successful expedition. If you're not resting and recovering, you're just not setting yourself up for success the next day. So I take my sleeping really seriously. Um, and that includes taking a pillow um, on an expedition, which I didn't used to in my younger days. I used to just be like, oh, my puffy coat is fine. I'll sleep on a rock. And I have done that. Or sleep on my bike helmet. I've done that before, too. Um, but I, I take a pillow now um, because I... I have neck issues sometimes, and I just really want to wake up refreshed, and um, sleeping well is really important for me. So also, with, right within my pillowcase, this is another one of those little tricks I do, is I put my earplugs always right in here, so when I'm digging around at night, it's dark, I'm like, okay, sweet, my pillow, my earplugs, good night. Um, I always take these on expeditions because there's snoring people, there's wild animals, and I don't want to hear none if they're going to eat me. Um, but there's a lot of noise out there, and it helps me sleep. But I always put it back in there in the morning so that I'm not digging around at night, looking with my headlamp, trying to find my earplugs. So I try to put things that go together, together like that. So that's the sleep system. What pad did you use? What pad? This was the ultralight. I, we, yes. Oh, look, it's right here. This one, the yellow one. Um, and, you know, you could do a shorter, smaller... Um, I tend, I like to sort of take a full length pad, just again, it's just a little bit, a few extra ounces. Um, I slept on the ground before with no pads, uh, but in something like this, six days long, I wanted to make sure I slept really well. Um, what I like about these is they're they're really fast and easy to blow up. You're not sitting there for 20 minutes, like, especially at 19,000 feet of elevation, like, oh, I'm dizzy, I'm dizzy, I can't blow up my pad. Um, they're really easy to blow up, and I love the the valve opens really wide to get the air out. Um, and I won't mention any names, but I've had you know old school pads where you're like trying to squeeze all the air out, trying to squeeze all the air out. And it takes so long, and then you can never fit it back in the little tiny bag. Um, these the air just is like comes out really easily. You can get it back where you want it. And little things like that, like if you can't get your sleeping pad pad into the stuff sack, those are the things that get really frustrating when you're really tired, you're hungry, you're lost, and you're like, I can't get my pad into the stuff sack. Like, why don't they make them bigger? Um, and it's something that I really do like about Sea to Summit is the stuff is, it's small and tidy, but it's also not so small that you're just like, you know, once you take it out of the store packaging that you can never get it back in again. I think we've all had that. So I do really like the way that they've They've thought about it, and it's really obvious that the people designing this stuff are actually using it. Um, and I've been using Sea to Summit since my adventure racing days. Um, and I talked to somebody, you know, I get to work with them, I get access to all this great gear, but I only work with companies that I would gladly buy the gear if I had to buy the gear. Um, I absolutely feel that way. Um, and so this is not just like I'm standing to see the Summit because they made me. I actually use this stuff. This one, uh, Andrew kind of mentioned, oh, he's like, oh, old school, because this is one of my original Adventure Racing Stuff Sacks. I still have it. It's probably more than 10 years old. Um, been around the world, I think. Uh, and it's great. It still works fine. I love it. Um, okay, so we'll go down to the clothing now. So uh, I didn't take very much on Kilimanjaro. It was going to be extreme temperatures. We started basically in the jungle, went through five different climate zones, and got up to above 19,000 feet. So everything from super hot and sweaty um, to really, really, really cold. And so I really poured over how many pairs of socks for six days. I only took two. Um, so I was like, I would rather take more medical kit stuff, more emergency stuff, than have uh, fresh smelling feet. Um, but they're really cushy, comfy socks. Um, and my feet were plenty warm. The shoes that I wore are the Solomons for the hiking portion. Um, they're on the backpack and I strapped them on just like that. And then the 510 Kestrels. I really tried to only take one pair of shoes, but I felt like I couldn't find one shoe that would that would be really good for riding and also good for hiking. And uh, if anyone's had a blister before, you guys know that can be a deal breaker, which is really crazy. So I did take some extra for my feet to make sure they were happy. Um, clothing. So I took one pair of short, one pair of bike shorts. I know it's kind of gross for six days, um, and that also converted to hiking shorts. Um, one pair of thermal liners, a thermal top, a bike jersey, one extra, and then my puffy coat, which is in here. And that's that's it for clothing. Um, minimal. Uh, you're in the open air. I don't care if I stink. It's more, I would rather, you know, you've got to bring the right layers. And so you'll notice these are all different waist layering systems.
things, but um, I didn't really bring two of anything other than the socks because it just isn't worth it. So then for the um, more mother stuff, rain jackets, rain pants, super essential for wind or rain. It didn't rain up there. My puppy coat. So I partnered this with my sleeping bag. So I knew I could skip a little, take a, a lighter temperature sleeping bag um, by wearing my puppy coat at night. Put the hood on, all good to go. Um, I really like this material from Patagonia because it doesn't feel um, slippery, slidey. It actually feels pretty cozy, kind of like a sleeping bag. Um, and this thing was great. Uh, and if you saw the video, if you haven't seen the video, that Red will do the seven minute video of our climb. Um, and you can see me at the summit. I have probably every bit of this on. I'm just like peeking out, um, out, you know, from my hoodie. And I use it all. Shell gloves, really key. These are great. Hats and a uh, wool buff. Um, wool is a really great fabric. It stays warm when it's wet. I love it. Buffs can go anywhere. Um, even in emergency, I've used a buff as toilet paper, thrown it away later. Um, but yeah, it's a very multifunctional little item uh, that you can use. So then we go down to uh, my little cup because I really like coffee. Um, but same with the packing system. I keep my headlamp in there. Um, so everything has a place. Everything has a color, and it all it all fit into that backpack. So with the bike, with my gear, the pack was 40 pounds. So the bike was 25, the pack was 15. Um, but we we walked up to the top of Kilimanjaro and and rode down, which is pretty sweet. And this expedition, I wasn't sure, but we could we rode probably 90% of it was rideable, which was really cool. I thought I'd be carrying my bike a lot more than I was, and it was really just summit day where we had to carry bikes. Personal hygiene. So this is my little toiletry kit. Um, I like these for toiletries, this kind of a bag instead of a stuff, stuff sack because it's just easier to, to kind of get into, get your stuff. Um, you're not sort of digging, pulling everything out at once. Um, so I really like these for like electronics and toiletry type stuff. Um, I use the wilderness wash. Um, these are little pocket laundry soaps. These things are pretty sweet. They're just little uh, pieces of paper that you add water to, um, super light small toothbrush and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the hand cleaning gel wherever I go especially in a place like Africa and you're sharing food with people um, it's kind of a community living super important if you get sick on a trip it's a deal breaker um, it, either you're not having much fun or it ends up no summit for you so I, I, I take my personal hygiene seriously except for changing socks because <laughs> I don't eat off my socks I don't eat with my feet exactly Sunscreen, super key, and uh, I really like these towels. So this is we're washing in streams, that kind of stuff. Um, I really like having a towel, super small, minimal. My uh, teammate was really jealous that I had a towel. He asked if he could borrow it, and uh, I declined. Because, <laughs> uh, no, you cannot borrow my towel. Um, medical kit, super important, goes with me everywhere I go. This is an adventure medical kit, and they do make standard ones that come with, like, certain things. What I do though with every medical kit is I customize it for where I'm going. And so, okay, I'm going to Africa. It's going to be hot, it's going to be cold, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. So I'm taking malaria pills, I'm taking, um, you know, anti-inflammatories, I'm taking allergy type medicines. Um, basically think of where I'm going, what are the things that are happening there, and I make my medical kit high um, based on where I'm going. And I will tell you, this is worth its weight in gold. Um, there's nothing worse than being unprepared for an emergency. And you're just standing there going, oh my god, I don't, I don't have anything. I don't know what to do. There's no worse feeling, and there, there's no better feeling than being like, sweet, I got this. Let me help you out here. Um, so if you haven't taken a first aid class, you like to spend time in the outdoors, pretty key. Um, I'm an EMT at home uh, in our backcountry rescue team, and you cannot believe the amount of people that go out on a five hour hike with no water or no anything and you always think, ah, oh, it's not going to happen to me, it's not going to happen to me. And I do it too. I go on a bike ride, I don't tell anyone where I'm going, I'm trying to break that habit. One of my favorite adventure medical kit things that I always have with me is uh, this clotting gauze. This stuff is really amazing. So for trauma or for heavy bleeding, these are really light, small things that are going to really soak up um, a lot of blood and stop can stop the bleeding. So. These kind of things for trauma, um, you think about the medications you need for illness, um, altitude sickness, all those kind of things are how I would build my medical my medical kit for, for
for Kilimanjaro, for example. And so this was about the size of what I took. Duct tape is always with me. Um, that's another key one. And then another thing I always take with me is uh, in here, this is a plastic shower cap. Um, these things are really great for uh, emergency cold weather extreme. You can get them in any cheap, crappy hotel that you stay in. Whenever I'm at a really cheap, crappy hotel, I'm like, oh, sweet, they have shower caps. And I have a stash of them at home. I've always got one of these in my bike, bag, wherever. They're so small. Um, you can put it on your head under your helmet, and it can save your life. It has absolutely... Same thing with surgical gloves. I always have surgical gloves with me for emergencies, but also as warmth. If I'm freezing and I can't feel my hands, I'll put them on under my gloves, and it works as a vapor barrier liner. So that's my adventure racing tip of the day, is the shower cap. Um, duct tape is in there. Uh, duct, duct tape can be used for closing wounds, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff, fixing your bike. Um, very handy. So then my little bike kit of tools. So again, there's not going to be a uh, bike mechanic up on top of Kilimanjaro, so, but I have to carry it. So I thought long and hard about what am I going to take with me? What's a deal breaker? You know, I didn't take a lot of spare parts at all um, because I had to carry them. So I took a couple of tubes for flat tires. I didn't have any, which was sweet. Um, I took some CO2. I always take a backup pump in case the CO2 doesn't work or I run out of it. Um, these little guys are uh, tire plugs, so if I tear a sidewall, you can put that in and close it up. You can also use duct tape for that or goo wrappers for that. I take a chain quickly. Um, I did not take an extra chain, so if I, had, if I broke a chain, I could fix it with this. Some patches in case I run out of tubes. Um, normally, I would not take the time to patch a tube, but up on Kilimanjaro, if I'm only taking two tubes, um, I might need to take the time to patch one. Uh, these are tire boots. Uh, goo wrappers also work just the same for a sidewall tear. A little bit of chain loop. An extra set of cleats. This is something that I did take. Um, if these fall off, uh, you didn't screw them in tight enough, um, that can be a deal breaker riding. Um, if anyone's ridden with their no bike cleats, it's, it's not very fun. Um, so I did take an extra pair of cleats. Um, and that's kind of it, and a pair of brake pads, because coming down uh, 19,000 feet to 6,000 foot descent, <laughs> I don't want to run out of brakes. So I took a pair of brake pads, which are also ultra tiny, ultra small. But I think about when I'm planning an expedition, what are the deal breakers? You know, what are the things, brakes are kind of a big deal on the biggest descent I've ever done, um, stuff like that. Sunglasses, a pair of gloves, and then same with the compartmentalization. I like to put all my food into the same place. It's all together. So I'll have a food bag that's in my pack for like longer stops of like lunch and dinners and stuff. But then I also really accessible in my bike jersey. I always have snacks that are there right away. Hi, Nora. You're live on TV right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so then a little bit about how I rig my pack. I practice this a lot in my hotel room and at home um, to find a way to carry the pack that it would be comfortable and I could get up on summit day, um, but that would also be easy for me to rig because most of the time we were riding our bike and I only, I had this set of my pack just twice um, where I take the, the bike on, take it off, but I didn't want to have to disassemble a whole bunch of things. So I used these straps from Sea to Summit, these were like amazing ones and it might not seem like a big deal um, talking about straps um, but the cool thing about these one they're very thin they're very small um, very lightweight they they loosen really easily with this tab um, and they also tighten really easily so it's a very quick on the fly sort of thing if I was hiking and it felt like you know I needed to tighten some, something up it was very quick to do that the other nice thing is there's a little release here um, so you don't have to unthread the whole strap. You can just slip it right off um, if, if I needed to take that off or to put it on. It makes it a lot quicker to set something up, like if you kayak or you're rigging or any of that kind of stuff. Having to feed the end of something through is kind of a pain. So I really love these hooky ones. And my first, I first thought, oh, well, they're going to come unhooked all the time. That's not like, I, they didn't at all. And I literally was like not careful with this pack, hiking with it with hiking poles putting it down on the ground, getting it up again, um, and it was pretty awesome. So this is the system that I designed, and it only took like, I think five straps together. One, two, three, four, six straps together down at the bottom as well, um, which was pretty awesome. I was pretty stoked about it. Uh, and I used this slow path, and I, um, 
I tried out a lot of different packs, and the reason I went with this one is really the carrying system. It is a dry bag, it's a cool pack, but to me, it was how is it going to feel on my body? Here's the pack here. How is it going to feel um, with a bike on my back? It's not the perfect load. Packs are really designed to have everything inside the pack, and I was putting everything outside the pack. So this was what I was most interested in, is can I rig it? Is this strong enough to hang my bike off of? Which, yes, it is. Um, as we found out, and I was clipping my bike to places that are not really designed to be clipping a bicycle. Um, and it worked great, but the biggest thing was that it was comfortable for me. And it didn't dig into my shoulders, it was fine, and the waist belt um, was nice and supportive and wide. So anyone who's done bike, uh, big backpacking trips or carrying bigger loads, you know, how it feels on your body is pretty important. Um, and then I also wore the pack the whole time riding when I was riding my bike. I wore the pack too. Um, and what I then what I loved about it is it cinched down really small, um, so it wasn't this big sort of thing while I was riding. It wasn't cumbersome. It's roll top, so you can make it basically as small um, as you want to. The outside pack is where I kind of kept my food and the th sunscreen, the things that I wanted to get to during the day. Um, what else? What am I missing? Anyone else climb Kilimanjaro? Anyone else bike Kilimanjaro? <laughs> Um, so this was my system for six days. What I would like to do now is if anyone has questions on gear or, you know, why I took what I took or anything like that. Like I said, you can watch the video. Um, it's a Red Bull video. If you look up Kilimanjaro, Red Bull, Rebecca Rush. And it was also a fundraising trip. So I climbed Kilimanjaro and also um, raised money for World Bicycle Relief. And they provide bikes for students in Africa to get to school. So the second part of the trip was going and visiting some of the school kids and riding bikes with them. Um, and so that's part of the video too. So it was a pretty special adventure for me, but also another way to use what I do to give back and raise awareness and just kind of the power of what a bike can do. And, you know, the bike can take us really cool places, whether it's to school or to work or to the top of a mountain. So that was my uh, little bike Kilimanjaro adventure. And thank you, Sea to Summit, for supporting me with that. Hi, Facebook. Um, questions? Yeah, bring them on. So did you hit a wall? During this, and if you did, what did you do mentally to get yourself through it? So the the biggest concern for me was the extreme elevation. I'd never been to nine, above 19,000 feet, and I didn't know how I was going to do. And so I did a lot of acclimatizing at home. I slept in an altitude tent and um, went to the altitude chamber in Colorado Springs and simulated Kilimanjaro, like the ascent on a treadmill, walking with a 40 pound pack. My coach and I designed like, okay, day one, you're going up 2,000 feet okay you're gonna and so we simulate I walked on a treadmill and the room you can make it different altitudes and so we did three days of just like ascending altitudes so that I could get a sense of how do I feel at 14,000 feet how do I feel at 17,000 feet how do I feel at 18,000 feet and for me that was really reassuring to know the, the basically to know my body and go okay that's how I feel when I need to slow down and what was really interesting when I got to higher and higher altitudes in the chamber um, even without all the science metrics and stuff like that, when I started to feel my face tingle right here, and I feel sort of like this pressure behind my eyes, that was my cue because then immediately Dean could see my heart rate, my muscle oxygenation. He could see like those um, scientific markers starting to drop where I wouldn't recover. But it was it, it was really valuable for me to just know the physical trigger so that I didn't need to be strapped up to anything up there to know that, okay, my face is tingling, I better slow down a little bit. And then we also worked on how much hydration and so it's really cool. I mean, you don't need to have that kind of access, um, um, but the things to think about are one, listening to your body and one, thinking about your food and hydration and your rest. Those are the things that break people down. And Kilimanjaro is interesting. It has one of the easiest one. And so people go too fast and they get altitude sickness and they can't summit. And there's actually a high fatality rate there as well because people don't listen to their bodies. Um, and so we took our time. People were like, oh, it took you six days. It's like, we could have gone faster, but we took pictures. We took, we took time to acclimatize and we took a rest day. So to go back to your question, long-winded answer, I didn't have, I mean, of course it was hard. And there were times where I'm like, oh, wow. Um, and I got a little bit sick on the mountain. I started getting a scratchy throat. And I was just like, uh-oh. Um, you know, gargling with salt water, that's what I did. That helps a lot um, to get rid of an illness. But I didn't bonk. I didn't hit any walls. But I did take my nutrition and all that really carefully and really seriously. 
and I was um, really kind of in tune because I didn't want to be turned around at the summit because I had a headache from altitude. You know, I didn't I didn't want to go that far and not make it. Um, and, and we made it, which was cool. But it's a very respect. If anyone's going to altitude, high respect for for um, you know we're not meant to be in those that kind of rarefied air, and it does affect your body no matter how fit you are. They, the fittest people get turned around. It has nothing to do with your fitness. It has to do with how you acclimatize. Um, so we did great. Um, Patrick, my teammate, had a few, uh, quite a few bike mechanic mechanicals, lots of flat tires. Um, so we were really down to the wire on, and he was using then used his fair stuff and most of my fair stuff. So we were down to like one tube left, and I was just like, okay. Uh, and we hadn't even started descending yet. That was on the way up. And so that was probably the biggest sort of really nerve-wracking thing was, um, was are we going to have... Cause I, and I said to him, if you run out of all this stuff by the time we start descending, I'm not walking my bike down with you because my bike's fine. So I'm going to ride. I'll see you at the bus. <laughs> um, but we were fine. We both got to ride down. It was super fun. Um, and then we did have some of the camera crew were definitely um, got sick and were feeling the effects. And... Um, it, it was really, it's the hardest ride I've ever done, absolutely. Um, but also the sweetest descent ever. You didn't need the spare pads. The brake pads? I didn't. No, I didn't have to change them. It was fine. No, I shouldn't. But yeah, I didn't want to be up there and like tough and killing It's hard to simulate that much descent, so you don't have to And they're so small. And those are the kind of things, they're no way, they're super small. Like, I'm not going to take an extra tire because that's too heavy. But extra brake pads, that's no big deal. So, Rebecca, I think yeah. the question really, too, that I want to make sure that we cover for Chris okay. is how do you deal with pain? How do we so, deal with pain? So, all of us in yeah. athletes, right? You're obviously, you're the queen of pain, so good question to ask yeah. you. But we, we all have these moments, and maybe not have happened in this one for you, this event, but I know it has in other events for you. So, when you hit that wall or you hit that part of, like, okay, I'm ready to sit down on the side, cry, and just be done, yeah. how do you deal with that, and what do you do to mentally get through that in your yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with mentally. A lot of times, our bodies are going to hurt when we do these kind of cool expeditions. When you push outside your comfort zone, it's going to hurt a little bit. And, I mean, I sort of have a theory. It's like pain equals pleasure, and maybe that sounds kind of weird. And like, But the harder it is, the bigger reward oftentimes. The things that we really struggle for, whether it's getting a job or doing a project at work or climbing a mountain, the stuff that you really have to be at your best, those are the biggest rewards. And I think... I mean, I'm all for people, whether it's running a 5K or climbing Kilimanjaro, pushing outside your comfort zone, because whether you succeed or fail, you find out what you're made of. And I will tell you, I have more failures than successes. Any successful athlete does, you know. Um, but we don't talk about the times we fail. We get up and we try again and we learn from that. Um, and yes, multiple times during any endurance event, I'm thinking, why am I, what am I doing? Why am I here? I should be home in my bed. Like watching TV, you know, that would be fun. I could be walking my dog right now. Um, and yes, there is the roller coaster that happens for any athlete, any person. Um, the trepidation, the nerves, like, am I going to make it? There was a ton of that at Kilimanjaro. I didn't really feel confident that we were going to make it until we were about about 800 feet from the summit. And then we got past the technical climbing part, and I'm like, at about 18,000 feet, I'm like, I think I'm going to make it now. You know, and I didn't know that till the very end. Um, and how I get through it, there's a lot of mental games I play. One is experience, knowing like, okay, I've been here before. Okay, I'm gonna rest. And I, I try to, like I said, control the controllables. I can control my hydration. I can control my food. I can control if I'm getting blisters or not. I can control how my pack feels. Um, and you can control what you're thinking in your mind. And I think most of us have a sort of a negative dialogue that happens a lot. Like, oh, I suck. I'm not good at this. I should have trained more. I, I should do that. And really just changing that to like, and it, maybe you feel like you're lying to yourself, but you're going, no, I got this. I can do this. If, if, if everybody else can get a Kilimanjaro, I can get a Kilimanjaro. So what? I have a bike. I can do it. And so I think changing the negative talk with the positive talk is really big. Um, and that's a lot of time why you need your teammates to sort of give you that prop up too, to be like, hey, no, you're fine. Um, can I say one yeah. thing? So I was riding with Rebecca one time, and I kind of I was in La Pain, and she she actually said this to me, and it's stuck in even lots of events I've done since then. But she said the pain will go away; you just have to let it, and eventually your body will feel good again. So just 
get through this section, and then all of a sudden you're going to feel great. And it's so amazing in races that that does happen. It like does. all of a sudden you come back, you're like, I'm like a rock star. What it's happened? a roller coaster. It yeah. is. And, and if you was... can take it in small segments, like, and I did right. this in Kilimanjaro, okay, I'm only going to worry about today. I'm not worrying about Summit Day. How do I get to camp in the best shape I can today? Um, and I'm not thinking about Summit Day. That builds the same. I'm not thinking about mile 95 when I'm on mile 20. And so I think breaking it into like little chunks is super important um, to keep your focus, keep you stoked, um, and also make it realistic. And yeah, um, some you know, pain is temporary. Quitting lasts forever. So to me, <laughs> that's a great it's, It is. And to go home, and if people are like, "Oh, what happened? Why did you quit?" If I don't have a really good answer, um, I'm going to be embarrassed to my family and my friends, but also to myself of like, wow, I, I quit just because it was hard? Really? What am I going to say? And so sometimes if my inner dialogue is, is kind of being mean to me, I think, well, what would my, you know, if my best friend was hiking with me and saying, oh, you know, if she was saying the words I'm saying to myself, like, you suck, you should have trained more, should you just been that, what answer would I give her? I wouldn't say, yeah, you're right, you suck it. I would be like, no, you can do it. Come on, let's just slow down a little. So think about, take yourself out of your own body, and what would you say to your friend or your family or who was standing there, who was struggling? What would you say to them and give yourself that little kind of a pep talk? Because I think we are really mean to ourselves. We're, we're really hard on ourselves. And, uh, you know, my... Andrew, would, you would never say to me, Rebecca, like, come on, you're going too slowly, whatever. You'd be like, hey, you know, I'll wait for you. No problem. Like... Yeah, so being, being kind to yourself, I think, is really important. And hi, Shanti. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. That's a good question. Because you can have all this gear dialed, and if this gear isn't dialed, then uh, forget it. You know? True. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just wondering what brand has uh, cycling slash hiking shorts. So I wore the my hiking shorts that are also cycling shorts. Um, so these are Patagonia. And I wore a different uh, underneath cycling short that's the Stelly brand, because I've worn those a lot. I know what they feel like. They have the padding in them. But what I, why I wanted these is because um, they're great for cycling, so I put these over the other ones. Um, but then I also, they doubled as a normal hiking short around Camp Short, like when I wanted to take the chamois off. Um, so I kind of had two things in one with this item of clothing. And I kind of look for that. It's like, oh, I can sleep in these pants, but they're also thermals. And I can hike or bike in these shorts. Um, so, yeah, these were Patagonia. They've got a new line of more cycling stuff coming out that's really cool. Um, but, yeah, that stuff's really personal. And you got to figure out what you like. I, uh, I walked with Nina and Santiago. It is. It's like because you just don't have time to like figure out what's bags. Yeah, and and with these shorts, for example, and the jackets I wear, I really like to have pockets and things because I want to put you know my food there, or I want to have access to stuff so that I don't have to take my pack down and figure anything out. So the stuff during the day is pretty reachable for me without having to do much of anything. Camelbacks right here, like it's all kind of within arm's reach while I'm moving. Um, and then at camp, it's all organized in, in these little bags. That's really great. Oh, one last question. Yeah. I love the chocolate there, right? Oh, <laughs> this is Lululemon. Really <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking for food that you were consuming? And you eliminate the water content that was in some of the food? Yeah. Just strictly hydration. How many liters were you consuming a day? How many liters of water a day? Um, we were moving. I mean, in general, for me, um, hydration, the way I figure out, like, a bike race or an expedition, about one water bottle of tall one, which is 24, 25 ounces per hour. That's kind of minimum for me. I drink a lot of water, and especially at all times, I work at um, And so I'll plan out, okay, we're going to move for six hours. This is how much water. And that's how my coach and I worked it out. It's like, okay, it's probably going to take you eight hours to get from camp one to camp two. And so, you know, I pack 300 ounces of water, um, or sorry, 100 ounces of water, plus a water bottle. And you can always dump it out. Um, chug it. And then, then I would also, in the morning, water is very, very heavy. So in the morning, I would make a point of really pre-hydrating, um, drink lots of tea, drink lots of water, and then also at night at camp, you know, we were down in tea. You know, that's why I brought this little cup, was kind of to me hydrate all the time. So I'm always, and the porters were really great about that. The guys, they're trying to 
trying to push hydration on you because especially going to sleep at night it does make a really big deal. I will say, you know, 45 minutes before bed, I stop hydrating, or about 45 minutes before any race starts, um, so you have time to empty your bladder. So you're not on the start line, or you're not waking up at night, um, keep interrupting your sleep. So I do sort of cut off the hydration of about an hour before bed so that you can get a good night's sleep. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of work. Are you running new? I was, yeah, I was taking electrolytes. Um, I was using the little fizzy tabs from Goo that I really like. Um, and then I also have some uh, uh, pill, electrolyte tablet pills from Goo that I really like to take. But yeah, um, for sure not just straight water. I was definitely taking electrolytes. And um, yeah, absolutely. Have you climbed Kilimanjaro? Have you got no, up high before? I've been high. Yeah, exactly. I just like, just never feel like I can hydrate enough on that stuff. Like, never can carry enough water. I never stop off and up yeah. melt the snow that's required to do it. It's super hard. And so then when you are stationary in camp, you are stopped, that's the time to really kind of power it down because, yeah, when you're on the move, it makes it more challenging. And I mean, I almost always do a camelback because I am way more apt to just make this motion than to take the water bottle, open it, you know, it's, it's quite a lot easier to make sure I drink with little sips as well. But yeah, once it's cold, then you don't feel like drinking, and then that's another sort of discipline, you know, discipline factor that's really challenging. I used to set, when we were adventurous, we would set timers on a watch, so it would go off every 20 minutes to minus eight drink, and then it'd be like, ugh, oh, because you don't want to, you don't feel good, you don't, you're not thirsty, per se, or hungry, but it's fuel. Um, so we would set timers on our watch, and you could do it every hour, or whatever it is, but kind of police yourself that way. It's a little bit annoying, but it works. Any other questions about packing or expeditions or any of this gear or my bike? Yeah. Would you have done anything different? What did you learn? Super good question. Yeah, somebody asked me that. Would I have taken anything different? And um, no is the answer. I was super happy with what I brought. Um, and the only thing missing from here is a little uh, is a little like technology bag. I did bring, um, and I think I forgot that. Oh, this one, yeah. Oh, so I keep my sort of electronics in here, and probably one of the heaviest things I brought. So I didn't put the Garmin out. I did Strava, Kilimanjaro, which was really not, not a bunch. You get the QOM on uh, that? There, you know, actually, no, there's a couple that I didn't get. But we were filming and stopping and stuff. And, but it was kind of interesting to see that I wasn't the only person who had Strava, Kilimanjaro. But this is probably the heaviest thing I took. It's a Gold Zero battery pack um, with USB plugs. And, you know, I use this to power my Garmin, um, my camera, stuff like that. So I did take this because I wanted to record the memories and there's no plugs up there. And so kind of having your technology and your batteries are becoming definitely part of the equation in an expedition is to be able to capture all that. So this was the heaviest stuff that I took. Um, I think they're selling these little pieces here for $5. Sweet. Right up at the desk. I bought like 20 more of them today, obviously. <laughs> Uh, and so would I do anything differently? Um, no, which is cool. Yeah. You still yeah. carry the brake pad? Yes, <laughs> I would. And I have changed my brake pads. Uh, Italy, Dubai, I did a race in Italy where I had to stop at a coffee shop and change my brake pads, and I was super happy I had it. Um, or you're a trail angel for somebody else. But yeah, I mean, it's ounces. It's, it, it doesn't, if that, you know, and there's certain things like that, and like this, uh, you know, that are always just in my pack. And the shower cap, because there's no, no penalty. Um, so those just kind of always stay in that little, in this little bag. It's just kind of always has a lot of similar stuff in it. Okay, so I have one final question. Please. Do you have like a lucky troll or anything like that that you must have, yes. that's a must have in your life when you're on adventures or whatever you're doing? Oh man, we're, so I have Andy. Um, okay. I do, I actually have a little gnome All right. that I, 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 I take him on expeditions. I took a picture of him on Kilimanjaro okay, so of Andy. Okay. So I take Andy out. I put him on a rock. Right. You know, I send a picture to my husband because my husband gave him to me when we were in Patagonia one year. Oh, cool. um, so yeah, and he's broken both of his legs off, and I glued him back on. And so <laughs> he's, good care of him. He, you know, he goes in my pack, but he, uh, Andy actually goes in a little tiny. He goes in this little thing. <laughs> And he's on my desk right now. So when I'm working, he's yeah. on my desk. But otherwise, Andy lives. This is his sleeping bag. All right. Um, 
So I'll send you, a, I'll post a picture of Andy, um, my little trouble gnome. So yes, if anyone's seen the movie, uh, um, Amelie, um, there's a trouble gnome in there. So yeah, he's my, he's my guy. Good question. That was, that's really funny. <laughs> I'll post a picture of Andy and I'll tag you in it. All right. But I do, I mean, that's a good point of like, you need to bring, like, whether it's a picture of your dog or, you know, remind yourself of, you need those little, when you are in those moments where you're just like, this is hard, this hurts, I'm cold and I can't sleep. And I kind of look at him and I'm like, oh, you know, Greg's thinking about me. And I, I think it's important that you kind of have those little, little comforts, little things that bring you back to the right frame of mind when you're kind of out there alone feeling lonely. What do you have? What do you take? Actually, for the first time, when I was in Leadville, the first time I bought him a stroller like there. Oh, cool! And so I pack him in my uh, in my cycling bag. Yeah. So every ride I do, I have him. I love it. Okay. So, anyway. and, you know, maybe it's superstitious, but totally is. <laughs> but it, it clicks your brain into into yeah. the place in your happy place. Yeah. It's always good to go yeah, to your happy place. Fixing the tire or whatever happens when I know I got that out there and I see it, I'm just like, oh, you're no, like, it's, it's gonna be all right. It's all right. Yeah. Got the lucky That's troll. Awesome. This happened for a reason. Cool. Anyone else have lucky trolls? Lucky? No. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, right? Because <laughs> the climb is so long and so sustained, did you alter the ergonomics of your bike to the seat bike climb even normally do? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, you're climbing for days, right. basically. Um, yeah. But I didn't. I had a dropper seat post yeah, for the descent, that. which yeah. was pretty awesome. But no, I rode it as I would normally ride my bike. Um, the one the one alteration I did make is since I'm carrying a pack, um, you know, 20. 20 pounds, which is a lot more weight than I would ride my bike with, I did have to alter my suspension. So the first day we got on and didn't realize, like, oh, we know more air in our suspension. And then we had to actually, as we got higher in altitude, had to check tire pressure and suspension quite a lot um, because it was changing as we went up in, in altitude. Um, but that was really the only alteration was the suspension and then having to drop our seat post was killer. I put on wider tires. Um, these. This is not the actual bike I rode Kilimanjaro with because I auctioned that bike off for World Bike School League. Um, but the way I tweaked that bike out, I put quite a bit wider tires than I normally would have. Um, a little bit beefier. I had 2.4s on there. Um, so wider tire, dropper post. Um, and those were the only alterations. Yeah. And a power meter, which was really funny because it was like zero power. You know, I put a 28 tube chain ring on the front. I normally ride a 32. So it went way down in years, and it still wasn't small enough. And I mean, from the first pedal stroke, I was in my smallest gear. Oh, I'm only at 6,000 feet, and I already wish I had smaller gears. Um, so it was really hard to have the power to pedal a bicycle at high elevation. That was one of the biggest challenges. It was almost like being really good at going super slowly without tipping over. <laughs> yeah, so it was slow going on the way up, but then super fun on the way down. Uh, it, well, if we didn't have to film, it would have been super fast. But I mean, we could have been down from you know, from top to bottom in probably four hours. Yeah, if we hadn't stopped to film, and then we stayed overnight on the way down and just kind of soak it all in. Um, but yeah, we could have been down really fast. <laughs> and that's what my teammate wanted to do. I'm like, well, let's, let's take pictures and. And, and we're filming, so it was fun. And the camps are really cool up there. If you guys go, I mean, it's very much an international affair, meeting people from all over the world. And I really enjoyed that part of just like sitting and talking to the guys and hanging out. Like, I mean, I'm I'm a racer, and so sometimes I'm all about yeah, I'll get to the top, get to the bottom. But it's really nice every once in a while to like be forced to take the time and just look around. So I got to do that on the trip. Thanks, everybody. Any more questions? Cool. Thanks, Facebook. See ya. Thanks for coming. All right, who's gonna pack my gear?